name is Father Russell Pollitt, and today I have two very special guests with me. The first one, Father James Mallon, who is from Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada, and the author of the book, Divine Renovation, and the coordinator for Alpha in Africa, Mobile Nobu, who is from Durban. And we're going to be talking today about Father James's book, but also his mission here in South Africa. So you've come now to South Africa and you're uh, going to be leading these conferences on divine renovation. You're going to be speaking to clergy. You're going to be speaking to many people around the country. Uh, what, what is your thinking behind the conference? Yeah, I think whenever I'm invited to, to come speak, I always ask you know, the people who invite me, well, what are your hopes? And, well, there's a sense that, you know, can we... Can this maybe be the beginning of something? Because mm -hmm. not everyone out there is going to be necessarily interested in, in, in what we have to say or willing to do something, but we don't need everyone mm -hmm. to be interested and willing. We just need a few. Mm -hmm. And who are the people who are maybe interested in taking this up and contextualizing it? What inspired you in the beginning to write this book, Divine Renovation? The origin of the, of the whole thing goes to uh, a, dis a, a real strong sense of discontent that I had with the, the state of parish life with, 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 with parishes. I had had my own conversion when I was 16, 17 years old and quickly realized that in order to find the community I needed, I had to find it in the movement. So I just went to my parish to get communion because the, the preaching wasn't all that great either. But people in the parish thought I was kind of weird, you know, because I wanted more. And I realized then there was this huge gap in the culture between the parish and 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 what we have in the movement. So now, you know that that you know the the, the fruit of of that that culture has is now being is now evident. Now the great change in the, in the broader culture and the parish system in in many places in the world is beginning to collapse. When I picked up this book and began to read it, I said, "Has this guy ever visited South Africa?" Because you outline issues which. Very often we think are, are local issues, but really we see that in the global church, we're facing an issue when it comes to evangelization, as you put it, from maintenance to mission. Well, I'm finding that a lot because uh, I just, uh, a couple of weeks ago, was in, was in the Philippines and found a very similar thing there. Even though our, our cultural context is quite different and you know, there's all, everything always has to be contextualized, but the underlying issues, mm -hmm. even though they may man, ma manifest themselves differently, the underlying issues are the same. The, 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 the self-referentiality of the church, as Pope Francis puts it, the fact that we're inward focused, that we've, we've got an identity confusion, we, we, we we're not intentional about, about mission, and we've get very, uh, we're very dysfunctional when it comes to leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, you put a lot of emphasis in the book on leadership, uh, parish leadership, but also on uh, you know, the leadership of the church, the hierarchical leadership and so forth. So you outline the problems, but you really identify how we need to look specifically at, at leadership and the leadership models that we're using, which in many ways, I guess, are outdated. Absolutely. Almost, yeah. you, you're kind of conceptualizing a new way of being church and a new way of leading the church. I mean, the only way we're going to reach a new way of being church, and that, that new way is, is nothing else than embodying what the church actually says about herself presently. I mean, we've got this amazing theology, very rich theology, but there's this huge gap between what we say and what we live. And so in order, in order to move from there, from here to there, then that only happens with leadership. But we've, we've got a very... I mean, even as people listen to this and hear the word leadership, probably different ideas yeah. of what that means pop up. People think, oh, that's the, that's the bishop, that's, mm -hmm. that's the priest. Uh, when I say leadership, I, I, I really, I'm not talking about positional leadership. I mean, we will always have positional leadership, mm -hmm. but the people don't today follow uh, positional leaders just because they're positional leaders. If they choose to follow a positional leader, it's because they have they have. Uh, character-based mm. leadership and I think that's uh, kind of a, almost a science it's an art that, that can that can be learned that people can become aware of and grow and yet uh, in, in our formation in the priesthood and in, in, in parishes it, it's not even on the radar mm. and and of course one of the things that comes out strongly in this book as well for me is we don't have to invent something new we've got it we're not using our own tradition well we're not using right. the resources and the sources of our own tradition as well as what we could be yeah mm -hmm. for, for sure and you know the in terms of the the key ingredients that, that make a parish healthy because i really believe that 
it really is as simple as healthy things go and bear fruit. Mm. And if you think of a, of a tree, there's nothing wrong with it, but our plant, there's nothing wrong with the seed. The seed is God's word. I mean, it's the problems in the church are not God's problems. So some people have an image of a kind of a miserly God who uh, is is very reluctant to, to pour out the grace of renewal for the church. So therefore we have to, we have to pray, pray, pray uh, so that we can get God to stop being such a, a miser and might actually pour, pour out grace for you. No, no I, I think we've got that all wrong. I think I think the Lord is is asking the same question he's, he's always been asking, that is, whom will I send? Mm. I, I think the Lord is, is got like buckets of, of grace saying, where where is there an opening? Mm. Mm. And he's looking for people to say, here I am, Lord, send me. I'm willing to do something. I'm, I'm willing to, to go to these people. I'm willing to break through the status quo. Mm. And the reason why we have to undergird, undergird all of our efforts for renewal with prayer is not to somehow change a miserly God, is to change us. Because this is risky business. You know, that's why we have, to, we have to begin with prayer. So there's nothing wrong with God, nothing wrong with the seed of God's word. This problem is, is in our church today, we, we, sh we show ourselves more attached to our model than the mission. Mm -hmm. And we're clinging to a model that is that has been built to reach a world that no longer exists, mm -hmm. a, a Christendom model mm -hmm. of, of church that, that presumes a Christian culture. It, for instance, it's like imagine you you have a, a school to train missionaries and you're sending these missionaries to France. So you got to teach them French mm -hmm. so they can go and, and speak to the people there. But 50 years ago, everyone in that country stopped speaking French and started speaking Spanish. But the training center for the missionaries are still teaching them French. <laughs> like that's what the church is like, you know. And, and we're like, well, we like French. Mm. We don't want to let go of French. That's become our tradition. Yeah. And, and, and that's a core question for us, the, the model of the mission. It's the question that Pope Francis asks in Evangelium, Evangelium 27, mm. where he says about his missionary impulse, I dream of a missionary impulse, mm. and the missionary option capable of transforming everything mm. so that our times and schedules, customs, ways of doing things, structures mm. can be suitably channeled to the evangelization of today's world rather than for self-preservation. Mm. That's, that's such a key vision of Pope Francis. I think that's, what, that's, his, that's the interpretive key of his whole ministry, I think. Mm. Yes, I mean, that, that's a really seminal document in, in, oh, in, in his ministry. Yeah. And you said coming through everything else, I hear in Mobile, yeah, uh, Affirming more and more as you talk, uh, your, your own experience in parish and your own experience of the church, the things that Father Mallon is speaking yeah. about seems to be the things that you've experienced. Absolutely. For me, I grew up um, in the parish and I became involved in youth ministry. And so I was on the front lines of seeing young people just engaging in a culture, um, in a church culture that wanted them to be there, but wasn't making them feel like they belonged. Mm -hmm. um, and when I began to ask the question seriously of like, you know, what is wrong? Why are you leaving the church? It was pretty much saying, you know, I can feel like I belong in the program and I enjoy being with my friends, but I don't feel like I belong in the church necessarily. Um, and so that's why when I read the book, Divine Renovation, I was so moved by that idea that you spoke about of being a warm, welcoming place where people feel like they belong. Um, can you speak more into that, the kind of idea of how do we make people feel the church is the place that they belong? Mm. Yeah, I think that belonging is, is such a, a key question. And I, I think, uh, just to kind of back up a little bit, um, you know, in coming out of a, a, a kind of a, a Christendom model of church, a Christian mm. culture, if you think traditionally in, in our cultures, we, we had a very strong sense of social values, how we were supposed to live our lives, and what was good behavior, what was bad behavior. We had very, even among different Christian groups, different, very clear lines of, of what you believe and what you don't believe. And, and if you if you behave properly and if you believe the right things, then, then you could belong. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a, a behave, believe, belong model. And, and Tick if, the boxes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but it kind of in, in that order. Whereas mm -hmm. today, if we're going to reach the, this culture of ours, we have to flip that paradigm around and we, we need to begin with belonging. Mm -hmm. uh, because today, no one is going to behave certain ways just because you say so or the Pope says so or the Bible says. They don't care. They, I, I, I behave out of what I say. Mm -hmm. I decide for myself what's right, right or wrong. That's just the way it is. And I'm not going to change my behavior until I personally believe that it's something that I should do. And that change of belief is only going to happen through an experience of belonging. And it's one of the things we love about Alpha because it, it perfectly embraces this paradigm of beginning with radical hospitality. Like, 
total welcome, loving people, not judging people, welcoming them where they are in the messiness of their lives. And then building relationships. And, and as we draw people into authentic community, and in that community is the hear the, the core message of the gospel to begin with, then over time, heart begins to open. Uh, they encounter Jesus, perhaps enter into, into a relationship with, with him. And at some point, you know, the experience of Jesus is going to, as a savior, is going to lead them to an experience of Jesus as Lord. Mm -hmm. And then, in a sense, the behavior thing falls into place. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so that, that's a real challenge in our system because we, we're still kind of built to presume that, that we kind of, we're going to begin with behaviors. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you, how do we, the core question is, how do we create places for people to belong who don't yet believe or belong, or uh, believe or behave? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and when our churches have become, in many ways, inward focused clubs of people who all look the same and sound the same, and, uh, this this is a great challenge, at least for for, for our parishes. Mm -hmm. well, Alpha has really uh, been the protagonist behind inviting Father Mallon to South Africa, setting up these conferences. Um, Alpha is growing in South Africa. I mean, you hear about it more and more. I remember many years ago, it was happening in the Anglican Church. It wasn't something that Catholics <laughs> did, and now it's widespread. Mm -hmm. What is Alpha hoping will happen? I think with Alpha, um, what we really do is we want to serve and equip the church in mm. its mission to help people discover and develop a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the beautiful thing about what Divine Renovation has done is that it's gotten this conversation started mm. within the church about how can we be more welcoming. And as Alpha, we're just there to say we're a tool that you can use to begin to go out and mm. also empower people in your parishes to go out and invite people in to really open up the doors that people don't just come in, but people are going out to invite others. Mm -hmm. um, and so for us at Alpha, kind of supporting this conference is really about serving the church in South mm -hmm. Africa and allowing them to begin this conversation about how to be more missional. Mm -hmm. um, and we're incredibly excited to have Father James here. Um, and so, yeah, that's really why we are so supportive of Divine Innovation. So your work's really going to come after the, yeah. the, the conference. I mean, you're, you're just here for a couple of days and then, so let's talk a little bit about post-conference. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what happens post-conference? Mm. Because that's always the hard part. Mm. How, how do you see that unfolding, both of you? I, I would say, first of all, I would, I would invite those who come to the conference and hopefully the priests that come will have lay leaders with them. Mm. And I think that's so important because what, what happens when, when I just speak to priests alone, which I, I don't do as much anymore for that very reason, is that even priests who are inspired, they may come for a day seminar or two-day seminar, and they think they're really excited about what, what, what they hear, and then they return to their parishes and open the door and get buried in all of the all of the stuff they have to do and all of the urgency. Urgent always always kills the important, the most important things. And, and so in spite of a desire, nothing comes of it. If a priest has lay leaders with him, then, then as you're walking out of this conference, you say to them, let's hold one another accountable that we're going to do something with this. Mm. So mutual accountability, and that, that's the beginning of, of kind of a, a whole model for, for leadership in parish is the priest, pastor, not just leading a team of people, but leading out of a team because you've got that built-in mm. accountability there. So bringing people around you who have the same heart and making a commitment to we're going to we're going to we're going to step into this together. Mm. Um, I would say that if if a, if a priest is really, really inspired to do this, he probably needs to go to his bishop and have a conversation around uh, a vision, because if, if if this connects, then there's something happening in the heart, maybe a, a vision, a dream of what your parish can be. Like, imagine, imagine if, imagine if it worked. What would our parish look like if it was actually living its full potential? Mm -hmm. And every parish is so incredibly rich with potential. Mm -hmm. Get get people in your parish praying, all the all, all your prayer teams and prayer ministries, get them praying, just, mm -hmm. just start praying. You know, one of the things that we did as a response to conferences and the, the, the continued inquiries we got is we, we felt called to start a ministry. So we actually have a divine renovation ministry and we have a number of resources that are available to help people. We have, we have a weekly video podcast that we do uh, that's out there. That's, and, and we also have, we actually have a coaching network for, for parishes that's more serious. That's for people who are really serious. And it's each, each year, uh, pastor and leadership teams receive up to 50 sessions. Uh, so it's 
you got to be pretty serious for that. And we also have uh, 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 online video training. So we've got a, a number of other books as well. So that's some of the resources that we provide. But certainly the, the National Alpha Office here mm -hmm. would be a great place to start in getting Alpha up and going. I mean, if you can even begin begin to identify the key leaders in your parish and go for coffee with them, sit down, share that excitement, begin to to, to share that dream and have their, the, them share that their dream for the parish with you and together let something begin to crystallize this this missionary in, impulse and then then begin to talk about it in your homily so one of the problems with preaching in, in our parishes is <laughs> we hardly ever talk about the the big story we focus on the gospel of the day the reading of the day and we never look at the kind of the at the macro narratives if, if, if you will we don't we never talk about the big why or the big you know who or like like what's it all about anyway what's the what's the point what's the purpose and and we need to start preaching homilies like that to help our people mm -hmm. you know lift up their eyes to something bigger and, and begin to develop the capacity to to dream and to and to and to live out a dream so when a when a parish priest speaks passionately about what he believes he could be possible mm -hmm. if we if we let God truly work. Uh, that that's a dream that can begin to inspire people. And people are inspired by dreams, right? Mm -hmm. Not by plans. I mean, but Martin Luther King Jr. didn't say I have an idea. Mm -hmm. He didn't say I have a plan. I have a to do list. He said I have a dream, and that, that's that's what inspires people. Start looking at Alpha and plan it. Do training well, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe within four or five months of the conference, you could start running an Alpha. And even from the start, don't just do alpha for your church-going parishioners. We don't recommend that strategy at all. And, and that's one of the things I think we do struggle with in South Africa. If I look at alpha and my experience of alpha in a parish, um, once alpha is done, we, we're not good at, at moving from that. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what tends to happen is people come back again and again and again for another alpha. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've, got to, we've got to try and take the next step there as well. Absolutely. Well, I think it's really about looking at Alpha as like kind of the entry. I think you call it the on-ramp, uh, mm. but kind of how do we get into, um, get people into the conversation of church? Um, but one of the things, uh, Father James, that you speak about a lot is the kind of pipeline of leadership mm, that can come right. through Alpha. Can you speak a little bit more into that? Yeah, see, this is really key because well, Alpha is ultimately, when, when people experience Alpha, you you don't really experience Alpha. If you, if you go to Alpha, you experience a church mm. and and alpha is as great a tool as it is to evangelization it's only ever going to be as good as the church that runs it mm. and, and so and so that's a very a very important thing to keep in mind and as a tool it's 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 actually difficult to get to get right people are like oh well, let's do that it's going it's going to be simple but there's there's all kinds of ways you can mess alpha up mm -hmm. and i know that because i've 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 made every single mistake you can make we've made it in fact we're, we're experts in this we, we actually have a talk on our podcast called how to kill alpha in 10 easy steps uh, and it's, it's it's a lot of fun because we've got personal experience of these alpha killing uh methodologies and and myself and my other other team members we've learned so much over the years but how to really maximize it because alpha isn't just a tool for evangelization it's a it's, it's a tool to bring about cultural transformation. Mm -hmm. it, it's actually got a built-in leadership pipeline because this is what you get to understand it is even as your guests come in the doors mm -hmm. and hopefully you'll always have a percentage of non-church going guests because if you're first the alpha that you do in a parish is 100% church going Catholics, I mean, how many subsequent impressions does it take to undo a first impression? I think it's something like nine, nine right? Years. Well, your first thing, experience of Alpha is that Alpha is a group of church-going Catholics sitting in a circle talking about church mm -hmm. and sometimes talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll never get it back. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you know right from the start that even 15, 20% of the guests uh, are non-churchgoers, non-Catholics, maybe atheists or whatever, agnostics, and you, you remind everyone all the time about that, not to presume anything, it's like you're, people gear down. And, and become conscious that they, they, they let go of certain presumptions. You've got to keep reminding people of that. And in that, you develop a sensitivity and almost like a training to, to the fact that we're not just, this isn't just a, a club meeting. This isn't a meeting of club members. So from uh, your guests, you're constantly saying, who, as, as, as the, the, the process comes to completion, 
who among the guests uh, do we want to invite back? And the goal in our parish is always to invite back as many as possible. We've invited people who are atheists back on the team. Because mm. the first step of serving on team is basically providing hospitality as a helper. Mm. You'll be in a small group, and surprisingly, people who have not had conversion, or that some of them say, yeah, the, we've had atheists who have come and served on, on, on the team because they wanted to, because mm -hmm. remember, belong, believe, behave, it begins with relationships. And then from among the guests, those who, are, who exhibit uh, relational ability and, and are warm and friendly, some of them will be invited to the next step to serve as a, as a co-host of a small group. Mm -hmm. And those, again, who have the ability will be invited to become a host of a small group. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're several alphas in at this point, and every time you're doing alpha, you're doing training, you're learning new skills, and then after serving as a small group host for a while, you might be, be asked to be an MC or be a kitchen captain or in charge of, of one core aspect of Alpha or run Alpha in your home or even join a connect group which is and become a leader there. That's, that's what we do after Alpha. And here's a critical thing. The only way to come back on Alpha is on team. Mm -hmm. in every, at our parish, every single time we do Alpha, our goal is to have 50% first-time team members. Mm -hmm. So it means we're constantly kicking people out. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't kick people out of the pipeline, the pipeline gets clogged. Mm -hmm. And Alpha became this, this great way to raise up leaders and equip leaders with, with a kind of a missional sensitivity and mindset uh, so that the values that experience in Alpha very soon entered into the whole church. Because probably 80, 90% of our ministry leaders now in our parish have, have all been on Alpha team mm -hmm. over, the, over the years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. It's a, it's a really wonderful vision of Alpha as well, which, which I think is important for us to, 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 to uh, take on board. One of the things that kind of worries me just a little bit, and you, and you touched on it earlier on, talking about contextualizing it. I read this book and, and I look at this book and I say, wow, yeah. I, I'm inspired by it. It does presume, in the way I read it, quite a lot of resource. Here in an African setting, where many of our parishes for example, even struggling to fix the holes in the roof. The resource issue is the thing that worries me, where we have a, a huge amount of unemployed people who would be quite willing to, to work for the church, to work for Alpha, and yet they need to be remunerated for the work they do. How do we implement a model like this that seems to be quite resource-heavy, so to speak? Yeah. It's a, it's a great question, and it's a question that we actually hear all over the place. We hear, we hear this kind of question in Europe. Most parishes in Canada don't have, have zero staff. There's not a lot of giving. And, and, and we often say, well, you know, don't begin with what you don't have, right? I once heard someone say, uh, while you're dream into existence, don't, don't how it to death. Mm, you know, mm, the, mm. the first thing we often go to is, well, how, how, how? <laughs> but let's start with wow, wow, wow. And, and we never used to have the resources that we have, and we never used to have the staff that we have. And when, you, when people begin to experience life transformation and take ownership of the mission, they will give according to their resources. And I, I think that no matter where we are, uh, resources will, will increase in, so, in, in some way. And if you invest them back into growing people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, I think resources of, of people and, and, and other things will, will, will grow and be, be made available. In the end, we say that the divine renovation as a proposal has three distinctive elements from perhaps any other, any, any other proposal. But the first that distinctive element is, is the absolute primacy of evangelization. Mm -hmm. So making that primary in, in all aspects of, of pastoral ministry in a parish. So it's, it's your starting point before catechesis and even sacraments. Uh, it's something that you never stop doing. You don't do Alpha for a little bit and then go do a bunch of other things and go back again to Alpha. Keep it going constantly. So the primacy of evangelization, we often say that it's, pri it's primary, but if you look at what parishes do, it's not. Mm. Second thing is the best of leadership. Mm. And that there are many things you could say about that, about all the different uh, issues around, around the leadership. And the third thing is the experience of the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, yeah, that's, if you begin to lean into those principles, uh, it'll make a difference. I want to pick up on, on, on what you said there, because I think it's so important in our context. Start with what you've got. 
And one of the things you, you said a few moments ago was about hospitality and the importance of helping people to feel that they belong. You don't actually need too much resource to do that. In fact, you just have to be human towards other humans in many ways. Um, and, and, and so I think that's an important message for us to hear, especially in our own context, because that's the first thing we always get, get said. Well, we don't have the resources to do that. That's so true. I'm um, really just starting from where you are and um, using the, the welcoming heart of people to really make people feel welcome in the church and then to begin to build from there. It's really important point in our context. You, you, you've said a lot about prayer, and you've, you've mentioned prayer and the Holy Spirit over and over. Many times in the church, we think it's about structure. We think it's about having a good program. There's also a deep spirituality to this, uh, from what I saw in the book, but also from what you've been saying. And I think that's important because, uh, you know, very often, as I say in the Catholic Church, we tend maybe to worry about uh, you, you know, the, the boxes and the structures and so forth. Mm. Do you want to speak a little bit about your own experience yeah. and how important that is? Uh, in our uh, our experience in, in seeing the parish transform is that parishes are transformed and people are transformed. Mm. That's it. And you hit a critical mass of people mm. and the parish feels like it's a different place because it is a different place. And in our experience using Alpha, you know, God draws people in at different stages, but in the testimonies that we hear around the parish, it often comes to, well, I, then I did Alpha, and then I went on the Holy Spirit weekend, and people prayed prayed over me to be, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we try to avoid strange jargon, but we just pray for people to have an experience of God's love. Mm-hmm. And, you know, St. Paul talks about God's Spirit speaks to our spirit when we cry out, Abba Father, and that's the kind of experience we're, we're praying for people, that they may just be filled with a sense of God's love and to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to have that religious experience. And we, we often are, our spirituality is often, we might be Trinitarian in theology, but we're often Unitarian or Binitarian in our, in our, in our spirituality. We have often reduced the uh, uh, Christianity to simply being about God with us. Mm. You know, the whole point of the incarnation was so that God could be in us. Mm. It's two totally different things. Mm. And the other thing simply is for the church as a whole, the leadership of the church for key, for key leaders at every level, we need to experience the empowerment of the Holy Spirit mm. because it's the one thing Jesus said we should wait for mm. before we go, go out into the city, before we go out beyond the city. He said, remain in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. See, here's, here's the thing in the end. Church and the church doesn't need to experience that once at Pentecost and go and, and they, that then goes out. If we as the church don't continually experience new Pentecost again and again and experience the empowerment, we always end up retreating back into the upper room. Mm-hmm. So my hope is that is that some people will be will be motivated to to actually take this on to have conversations with their with their pastors mm-hmm. for priests have conversations with their bishops. Uh, because it's not for the faint of heart. The recipe for parish renewal is simple. It really is simple. It's a simple recipe, but it takes time mm. and it's hard work. It's painful mm. sometimes. It's in Benedict Parish where I was when I when I wrote the book. I mean, they were in year year eight of this journey, and we're we're still not fully arrived at where we would like to be. It just mm. it simply takes time, and so there's that raises all kinds of other questions around you know long term leadership of priests mm. because so often in our church. Even priests who begin to lead change and get things going, in many places in the world, this is custom. After six years, you get moved, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and so it just you, you hit the reset button because mm-hmm. everything falls apart with the next leader, or then the next mm-hmm. pastor either dismantles it or lets it just lets it fall, fall apart. But I'm here to say that look, if there's anything in our experience that's helpful, I hope that you can take that because. From my context of working in, in, in my parish, I don't, I'm not coming here in any way to say that what we're doing is, is the best way to do mm. it or is the best answer. All I know is that the answers we're proposing to the problems today are better than the answers we used to propose. And I know that and we've seen fruit from it. So if there's anything uh, that's helpful, I hope you can take that and, and, and move with it and perhaps begin a, a different kind of conversation. And... For leaders who are particularly keen to move forward in this direction to connect with one another, because it can be it can be a lonely thing. Mm-hmm. If you're a, a priest in a diocese who says, I, I really have a sense and I, I want to answer the call. Because mm-hmm. I think if we all have the call, 
I want to answer the call to, to lead my parish, to begin to actually lead it and not just be a caretaker, not just respond to people's perceived needs, but actually be intentional about turning my parish outwards. Mm-hmm. Um, with that, you know, will, will come a, a bit of loneliness because mm-hmm. it, you know, there might not be others around you who are willing to go there. Well, Mobile, Mobo, thank you very much uh, for, to Alpha, I think, uh, who's been driving uh, this visit of uh, Father, Father James Mallon also certainly has been uh, promoting his book all over. And as I said earlier, everywhere I go in the country, people are talking about this book. And I think it's, uh, I think it's wonderful. And we're hoping that we can support Alpha and do as much as possible to ensure that we continue on this journey together. And uh, we do really become a church that is, that is missionary, missional, as you, as you said earlier. Thank you so much. And me and Alpha are so excited about the journey um, of the church going forward. And we are here just to serve, um, to serve the church and its mission. So thank you. Good. Thank you. And Father James Mallon, thank you for coming to South Africa. Thank, thank you for your ministry. Thank you, uh, I think, for, for the energy and the work that you've done uh, and, your, and your commitment to ensuring that uh, this church that we all love and serve is truly going to become the Church of Christ. Mm. The Divine Renovation Conference could not have come at a better time. I think it has come at a time when the church actually needs to be renovated, kind of to be rejuvenated in terms of its mission as an evangelizing tool to the peoples and to the Christians. And especially now that the faith seems to be going down within the countries, within the parishes. I've really enjoyed the conference so far. I think I'm so excited to start implementing this within our parish. Um, We're looking forward to to this change. My hope is that uh, I and others like me would be able to take what we've learned here back to our parishes. The most valuable thing is to have a team that has the same mindset behind the the parish priest. The realities around leadership were quite key. I've never seen myself as a leader, but just realizing that leadership is influence. And so wherever you have influence, you are a leader, whether you think of yourself as a leader or not. Learning about ways in which to become a better leader and so that your, your gifts can be used more efficiently for the body of Christ, that's something useful to learn.